But this gets us right to a central mystery of Malcolm Turnbull, is that he doesn't really seem to be a person who's deeply interested in politics. <laughs> I mean, being Prime Minister, perhaps, or even being Leader of the Opposition, but, but he doesn't really strike you as a politician. You know, I think that he would make um, a terrific head of department. It's, it's a weird thing to say, and, but he, he's interested in policy, I think. I mean, you know, he has an obsessive interest in, um, in learning the fine point, far, finer points of a particular policy area. I and mean, I was talking to a, a, a chap earlier, Andrew, who was, um, had, had am I about to embarrass Andrew? I hope not. Um, talked about having um, emailed um, Malcolm at 2.45 a.m. Um, as a public servant, a praise of a PhD that um, a friend had written on a fairly um, technical area. Heard back from Malcolm at, you know, 2.48. Um, I don't want your dot points. I want to read the whole PhD. Send it to me, you know. <laughs> Extraordinary, but very typical of Turnbull. And, and you know, if you... Uh, he, he got very interested in water policy. He's very interested in... Um, uh, um, carbon capture and sequestration and biochar and all of that. And, and that involves him reading everything that there is to know on the subject. I mean, he has these sort of particular... Like obsessive... a, barrister, a barrister doing... No, no. I, I, no, I think that... No, I, I think he's, he's, he's legitimately interested in these subject areas. I mean, it's almost like a senator, you know, going through legislation and kind of going into the micro detail. It, it means that sometimes he remains at the micro detail level. And so... Um, he makes the mistake that seasoned politicians don't make, which is to assume that everybody is listening to his every word. So quite often he'll go into quite a bit of depth in an interview, and he'll say, well, look, as I wrote in this essay, you know, that I published six months ago, I mean, I assume you've read this, you know, and, of course, you know, it's not a perfect assumption by any means. I think that he, he kind of... Um, hangs around on this micro level sometimes and, and, and doesn't remember the first trick of, unfortunately, opposition politics, which is uh, forget everything else you were going to say. F find a five-word line and repeat it a million times until you feel like stabbing yourself. And, and you know, <laughs> the, the key to um, uh, opposition politics, unfortunately, is, is, is simplicity, not getting it right on the detailed argument, which is a mistake that he makes and that, that Kim Beasley used to make, I think, too. Um, but and you just have to grind away. Yeah. And when you say that he's not interested in politics, I think you know, that there might be something to that. I, I think that he finds the, the rough and tumble of politics or the, or the grunt work of politics, which is taking position A, your position, and trying to get it to become everybody's position without losing its essence. You know? and, and it's grubby, kind of tiring, dispiriting work. And I think that he finds that Difficult, I think he finds it puzzling that it has to happen, you know, because his approach, I think, through life has usually been, well, look, you know, here's, I mean, I'm good at this, here's what I want to do, and I'm going to do it, and he gets there. It's very difficult, I think, for someone like that to adapt to a situation, um, uh, the situation that you're in, in in politics, particularly opposition politics, when you've got a room full of, you know, 100 people, half of whom, you know... Uh, wish you ill will, um, you know, at least a third of whom are absolute dolts, you know, and, um, you know, and they've all got to vote, you know, it's just sort of, oh, really, you know? <laughs> and unfortunately in opposition, you know, the worst thing is that, um, you know, you, particularly new oppositions, there are groups of people who have been holding the line and being disciplined under John Howard for, you know, 13 years or whatever, and then and they lose government. And all of a sudden it's, well, now it's time I had my say, you know. <laughs> so Backbencher X is up there banging on about whatever it is that he's been sitting on for nine and a half years, you know. And once, you know, now I'm going to have my say. And, of course, it just makes the job of a new opposition leader even less pleasant than it, you know, already organically is, which is pretty unpleasant. I wonder whether making yourself the expert on Malcolm Turnbull <laughs> is a bit like doing a PhD in Icelandic or something, that, that it's not necessarily going to be useful um, <laughs> further down the track. Um, I mean, Says a man who just completed a major piece on the visit of Archduke Ferdinand oh, to you. Australia. <laughs> in what year? And, uh, that was and, immensely illuminating. Um, <laughs> 
which beasts he shot. Oh, no, 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 fair enough. You're to blame. <laughs> um, you were the person who told me about it. But, 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 what's his chances? Not great. Um, not great at this approaching election, that's for sure, um, because uh, politics being a, um, a science of orthodoxies has a very strong orthodoxy in Australia that tells us that first term governments very rarely get tipped out. And if you, I mean, if you take the first term at the Howard government, which was a, just a total bungle fest, I mean, you know, really, yeah. it's hard to imagine anything, you know, less prepossessing than that two years um, in terms of the government's first efforts. You know, they lost ministers all over the place and then went to uh, an early election offering a new tax. You know, I mean, it's quite an equation. Um, and John Howard, it has to be said, you know, had a huge buffer, you know, uh, up his sleeve and, and, that, and that helped. Um, but I think that if you compare that first, I mean, John Howard, I think, um, a, a attempted a lot more reform-wise probably in his first term. Kevin Rudd has been um, uh, occupied with uh, challenges that have come from abroad. Um, I think he's generally esteemed to be doing a reasonable job. I think it's unlikely that the Australian electorate is likely to turf him out for any opposition leader um, and, and probably not Malcolm Turnbull. My own feeling, and you know, I don't base this on any um, confidence from him, is, is that he doesn't really strike me as the kind of hang around for three terms type mm -hmm. opposition leader. I, I would see him as a pretty much one shot, shot in the locker sort of leader, um, partly because um, I think he, he, he hasn't ever done anything in his life for more than a sort of set chunk of time. Yeah, um, it's, he's done a he lot of things on. in a short time. And, uh, you know, obviously there's uh, plenty of other things he can do. Um, so I, I, I might be wrong about that. That's just a feeling that I have. Um, and there's also, of course, the possibility that he may not get the option to stick around for another term of opposition if, as you know, the, uh, in the grinding 14th year of uh, the Costello studies <laughs> tells us if, if, if Costello is planning to hang around and then, you know, be graciously drafted after the next election, I think that there are probably people in the party room that would be uh, uh, very, uh, very pleased with that arrangement. So. But the one thing you can't deny about Turnbull is that he's not dull. He isn't dull, no. We went um, last Christmas when um, uh, he was very new in the leadership. He staged the opposition leader's Christmas drinks in the uh, opposition leader opposition party room. Now, um, it was really a, not very long at all after he'd um, taken over uh, the leadership and... Um, <laughs> it's very traditional on these occasions for opposition leaders to give worthy but dull speeches about, you know, well, it's great to be here with the fourth estate and the cessation of hostilities. <laughs> oh, Merry Christmas all. Um, <laughs> and uh, instead, he kind of, he looked up at the wall where um, they have large and alarming, alarmingly uh, enlarged headshots of all the former leaders. Um, the Howard picture that they use is early Howard when he still had the brows and the teeth and the glasses and so it's quite, whoa, hello, <laughs> I remember you, yee. Um, and, uh, um, and then, you know, there's one of Brendan Nelson looking as though he's about to burst into song. You know. and, um, and instead of telling us any kind of, giving us any sort of bon mot about politics or uh, he told us this cracking story about Kerry Packer. Um, and, you know, Turnbull is great like this. I mean, he responds with an anecdote very well. And he's got an outrageous selection of really good anecdotes to tell. And this one was about when um, Kerry Packer was trying to sell Channel 9 to Bond. And, uh, of course, um, Kerry Packer had a very vexed relationship with his own father, the way to paint. Pank Fracker, yes. <laughs> Pank Fracker, as he was known to his intimate... Only twinklets, yeah. yes. We didn't call him Pank and get away with it necessarily. It sounds like a runism, doesn't it? Oh, holy, you know, stone the crows, you bloody Pank Fracker. <laughs> sounds like a... <laughs> a new line in the new ochorisms of Kevin Rudd. <laughs> Fair shake of the sauce bottle, unbelievable. <laughs> you ever heard that you before? Never hear... Turnbull would never do that, would he? To attempt so little by way of expression and still to mess that up is just unbelievable. Um, anyway, but here we are. no, Christmas. he wouldn't do that actually. And the funny, uh, one of the interesting things about Turnbull is he is pretty much the same person whomever he meets. Um, he's not he, much like Howard, I think. Um, whereas 
Rudd is uh, often noticeably different depending on which crowd he's addressing. But anyway, sorry. Uh, Pank Fracker. We're back at, we're back at the Fracker Mansion. Um, <laughs> so um, Kerry uh, apparently was um, uh, frustrated with the progress that Turnbull was trying to make and, and, and demanded a meeting with the Bond people himself and summoned them into his office. And Turnbull came along too and noticed, Turnbull says, when he, when he walked into the room that um, there was a new portrait of Sir Frank hanging above Kerry's desk. And Turnbull noticed and thought, that's weird because that's never usually there and it's not as though um, Kerry Packer was regularly sort of weeping over portraits of his father. Anyway, uh, this conversation, this negotiation was going on, as we know, um, Nine was eventually sold to Bond for a ridiculous sum, but at this stage it was still under negotiation. And um, the Bond people were playing hardball, and Packer said, halfway through this um, negotiation, starts sort of sniffling a bit, you know, looking a bit moist, and starts gazing at this <laughs> portrait and saying, you know, it's just, it's just that, you know, my father just loved this network. And I just, <laughs> when I think of what he'd think of me selling, and I just think, I'm just not sure that I can do it. You know, whereupon his inflated figure was um, agreed to. <laughs> and this delegation left the room and apparently Packer then turned to Turnbull and winked at him and said, so son, what do you make of that? <laughs> it's a brilliant story. Okay, well, let's see what we make of this. There are two microphones here. Does it work? Yep. Um, Annabelle, I was yes. just very interested to know why you didn't interview Lucy Turnbull and quote her on record, because she's a modern woman, a free woman, comparatively, one assumes. <laughs> I think so. Um, <laughs> we know that Malcolm Turnbull likes the truth. I actually think Malcolm Turnbull's got to a time of his life when he knows that what's important is actually to be a good boy. I didn't talk to Lucy Turnbull. I didn't interview her um, extensively about their marriage because I didn't really intend it as a profile of the marriage. I, I mean, I've mentioned her throughout because I think she is a, um, she's an extremely important figure, um, not just emotionally for Malcolm Turnbull, but also professionally for him. And, and one of the interesting things, I think, about their relationship is that, um, is that Turnbull constantly cites her, you know, um, and it's not, you know, just for appearance's sake. He, 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 he esteems her political judgment above almost all others, and there are plenty of people who think that he's right to do that. Um, and I think that if you look at all of his major enterprises and successes in life, she has been there not, you know, as a wife, but actually as a, um, as a, as a, as a legal partner. In, 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 for instance, Spycatcher, a lot of the legal work was hers. Um, in the, um, in the uh, attempted takeover for Fairfax, um, he credits her with a lot of the, um, the legal work that allowed him to get the junk bondholders on, um, on side. So I think that she is actually kind of significant beyond just the marriage. Um, I didn't interview her on the record because I didn't, I, I mean, I, you know, perhaps I should have. I, I feel that um, I didn't really go into their sort of their, their marriage as such because there wasn't really time I, and I, or space and I thought that um, uh, I wanted to go through his career. So I, I talked to her kind of on background and left it at that. I thought she was a strong figure in the essay. Now, more questions? Hi, do you think we actually, both political parties really need to recruit people like Malcolm? I mean, it seems as though there's so many dreary politicians that have had limited experience that have, have inherited the seats of their, their mother or father or whatever, and they're, they're just dragging the, you know, I mean, here's a person who actually knows what's happening in terms of international financial matters, and yet we, we, we tend to make fun of him because of his competence. Yes, that's right. I mean, um, it's a point well made that people who are successful that go into politics end up having their success um, minutely analysed. It's one of the things that puts people off politics. And um, it's fair enough for Malcolm Turnbull to feel, feel cheesed off that his, his, his millions um, uh, make headlines. But then again, I mean, we, we do, um, you know, we do seek to know a lot about our politicians and, and, and that's fair enough too and you can't really avoid um, a study of the background. I don't think that um, Malcolm Turnbull needed much recruiting actually, <laughs> although there was of course some famous attempts to recruit him for the other side of politics. We need to recruit, uh, recruit people like him rather than what we've got. 
Are there people like him? Yeah. <laughs> We've already got the one. <laughs> I don't know that there's any others. It's not degree. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I think he's an asset to politics. I think that um, y you, you wouldn't want everyone in politics to be a, um, a swashbuckling multi-millionaire kind of... Um, you know, you need um, you need all sorts of different politicians. One of the um, parts of the essay um, that deals with the Liberal Party actually goes through the cultural changes that went on inside the Liberal Party after the 1996 election. I think the, the class of 96, the 38 odd MPs that were elected for the coalition in that election as part of the Howard landslide, actually became incredibly critical to the way that government evolved and, and the way the culture evolved in the Liberal Party. Um, it ushered in a new kind of um, model of what a successful um, coalition MP was. It's it was sort nothing of, like Malcolm Turnbull. Well, no, it's nothing like Malcolm Turnbull. It, it, it was sort of, you know, before 96, it might have been a bit more Alexander Downer-ish, and after 96, it became very much more Jackie Kelly-ish. You know, it's quite a change. Um, and, and, and that model doesn't have a lot of room for somebody like Malcolm. I, I think that's one of the things that he's struggling with within the, uh, within the Liberal Party at the moment. I get this feeling in some ways that this is a portrait of a throwback for the Liberal Party. This is this, is, this sort of grandee coming, coming late in career. Mm, and, mm. and because a, a long time ago I did a bit of writing about Sir Garfield Bowie, there is the same kind of sense of somebody coming quite late in their career with a fully established reputation already, and the big question being at that point, for all of their sort of prestige and immense skill, can they actually hack politics? Can they hack parliament? And I wonder, I, I get the feeling that's still an open question with Malcolm. But the great thing is, and surely you must be surprised at this, for a person with a volcanic temper, he's not lost his temper in public yet. No, um, not to my knowledge. And in fact, he, he's lost it very rarely um, with his colleagues either. I think that one of the things that he's, he's trying very hard to do um, is to, um, knowing that, that a lot of his colleagues uh, suspected him of high-handedness, so, you know, the way that he took the seat of Wentworth was certainly a fairly, um, <laughs> well, in, <coughs> in terms of the Liberal warfare, Party... Warfare of the most appalling kind. <laughs> it was, you know, for the Liberal Party violence of the most sickening kind. It was just an incredible um, piece of work. And, uh, you know, a lot of people kind of looked at the way he approached um, the seat of Wentworth um, and looked, they thought that it was more of an ALP-style, you know, um, takeover. And when he arrived in, in Canberra, I think he was viewed with great suspicion by a lot of his colleagues who... Um, didn't like the way he'd done things. And I think he worked very hard over his um, first couple of years on the backbenches to endear himself to, uh, to other MPs. I think he's obviously got a post-it note somewhere that just says, consult, Malcolm, consult wildly. Because, I mean, he does ask people their opinions, you know. He's obviously trying very hard to, um, to fight against the perception that he's, that he's you know, autocratic. Mm. And, and talk to Lucy... And yeah. don't lose your temper too much. <laughs> and wait. But can he wait? Can he wait? Can he wait for the prime ministership, do you mean? Yeah. For a number of terms? Yeah. I don't think so. I mean, that's my guess. I, I, I think probably not. One more question. I was wondering if you could um, maybe comment on the parallels in personality traits between someone like Heating and Barnaby Joyce and Malcolm Turnbull. In, the, in, the, in their divisive <laughs> nature. You know, they're... they're their attitudes are very divisive. They create division in the community, they create debate in the community, and therefore the spotlight mm. tends to focus on them. Um, I was just wondering if you had any insight into, into well, that sort of... One thing that those three people share, um, I think, is an ability to speak memorably. I mean, Keating's great and penetrating attribute is his ability to... I mean, he's almost like a cartoonist with words, you know. Um, he can reduce an opponent with a couple of strokes to rubble. I mean, and, and that's an extraordinary ability to have. I mean, it's, it's, what it is, is just, it's almost like it's a brilliant headline writing. It is, almost. And, and um, his ability to, I mean, his comment on Turnbull um, uh, after the election was, Malcolm, oh, yes, he reminds me of the big red bunger on Cracker Night, you know. <laughs> you, um, you light him up. 
It's a bit of a fizz and then nothing. Nothing. <laughs> I mean, devastating, because it kind of goes to, to Turnbull's weakness, I suppose, which is that he's incredibly interesting for his own self, but, you know, um, it's not entirely clear what a, what a Turnbull-run Australia would look like. I mean, he's not kind of driven by the same, you know, nightmarish visions as John Howard. He went through the entire 80s, you know, just wanting to deregulate the work, labour market, you know, and, and that was his kind of obsession. Um, <clears throat> Barnaby Joyce, um, I think, has a, um, a less sophisticated but um, often quite resonant use of language. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's not all that many, you know, in politics now that um, don't speak like they've just digested politics 1A. Um, Malcolm, I think, is, is probably a little less theatrical in his style of um, uh, delivering critiques, but he is probably the best speaker, I think, in Parliament, in, in Parliament Crisp presently. Crisp and interesting. Crisp and interesting. Mm. But memorable? No, not as memorable in the way that... You know, not memorable in the way that Keating was memorable. I mean, he doesn't um, craft those beautifully executed, you know, little bullets of, of, of prose. I want to do you slowly. But, yeah, I want to do you slowly. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I think... We're kind of in trouble with political language at the moment. I, you know, the Rudd government really freaks me out on that level. I just, you know, I can't uh, understand sometimes um, even what's being said. You know, it's the the approach of jargon is is sort of inexorable. I think. 